start with this evening? Yes, we are. Okay, so some bites and stings. There's arthropods, and that includes your insects, your spiders, and your scorpions. <laughs> okay, uh, and then there's reptiles. We're going to talk about um, pit vipers and coral snakes. Um, and then we'll also talk about some venomous marine life as we work through this evening. Okay, so bites and stings death. Insects account for 50% of deaths as it relates to bites and stings. Snakes are about 30%. Spiders are only 14%, and then 6% would be that other, like that marine life, and so on and so forth. It's that 14% I'm worried about. Yeah, I thought about 30. What, what would be considered an insect if not a spider? Spiders have more nope. legs, that's why they're not insects. Spiders are arthropods. Right, but I mean, what, what, would, what would account for that majority? Bee stings. Bee stings. Yep, absolutely. So, speaking of, <laughs> all right, so here we have bees, wasps, hornets, yellow jackets, and ants actually fall into this uh, hemoptera. Ants? Yes, ants. Really? Look at them. They're segmented bodies. They don't fly. No, no, no I know that. I'm just saying I didn't realize that, that people were injured by ants. Oh, they Well, same family. So we're talking about what falls into this category. And remember, um, ants typically don't cause you a whole lot of problems. Uh, some people can be, like, overreactive to them, mm -hmm. but typically you don't see a whole lot of, like, um, anaphylaxis okay. because of them, okay? Um, and these account for about 25 deaths per year, so honeybees are 50%, and then the yellow jackets and wasps account for, like, the other 50%. Um, and so problems, kind of like Ashley said, the problem isn't the actual sting. The problem is that these people have severe uh, allergic reactions, and they go into anaphylaxis, which is anaphylactic <coughs> shock, or shock due to, you know, right. So this is kind of an overreaction. My body overreacts to. So typically, this isn't the first time event. So the first time they're stung with a bee, they may have a reaction. What you have to understand is each time somebody is stung or exposed, the reaction has potential to worsen. Okay? So if you go out there and they say, every time I get stung by a bee, my throat swells shut and I have to be on a ventilator, you should have called ALS a long time ago. Okay? Because you can almost lay your cards down that it's going to happen again. Um, toxic venom effects are pretty rare. All right? Um, so what happens? You get that sharp burning pain. They're going to get itchy and they're going to kind of swell. How many of you guys have been stung by... Just yeah, a few of us? Yeah, absolutely. I've been stung by a wasp, and I actually, um, to share a story, I was camping, did I tell you guys this? I was camping with my daughter and got stung in the mouth. It was horrible. Oh, it was, oh, I, oh no, I was swollen on the inside, too. It was horrible. And it was painful. I was in pain for days. Yeah, it was bad. Okay. <laughs> I ran from the bus all the way into the emergency room. Bees and dogs can smell fear. Well, they knew. I'm just kidding. I don't know. That's from a movie. It's my hair products, I think. Oh, it's gosh. It's got a lot of floral stuff in it. So it was like, she's a flower. <laughs> no. uh, maybe. Um, some of the extensive reactions can involve the whole extremity. So the people who are sensitive to, say, ants, you know, ants cause that localized, okay? But people who are super sensitive may have half of an extremity involvement. So if I get bit on the foot, I may swell to my knee and be itchy. Okay? Um, tongue, throat stings obviously can cause airway loss. So even if you're not allergic, you have to be careful about even the location of the stings in general. All right? Uh, some systemic reactions. So the mild systemic reactions, you're going to get the diffuse itching. Urticaria. Do you guys know what urticaria is? No. 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 Nope. Hives. Your to carry is hives. Okay. Um, swelling distant from the sting site and then flushing. Isn't that like the hives almost? Like the no. Some people won't have hives. They'll have an absence of hives and they'll just get red and flushed. Okay. So they are different. And I don't, uh, 
Let me think about it for a second because there's actually a term for it. And okay. Yeah. Let me think about it for a second. Um, so systemic reactions. So these are the more severe reactions. You're going to get that laryngeal edema. Okay. Where is that edema? What does that mean? Around the yeah. So kind of like a throat swelling. Yeah. It's going to be an airway obstruction. Absolutely. Um, severe bronchospasms or difficulty breathing and profound hypotension. Why do they have hypotension? Listen to what you said. I mean, no, that's not what I meant. Yeah, vasodilation. Sorry. Okay, this is that container problem. The blood, the volume isn't the problem, but the container gets way too big everywhere, and then there's not enough blood to fill it. Okay? That is anaphylaxis. It takes this hypotension to technically have anaphylaxis because that's shock. Okay. Um, some other causes you can actually have anaphylaxis from medications, foods, and plants. Okay, foods are pretty common, so are some medications. Uh, what do we do to take care of them? So we're going to remove the stinger. Never ever use tweezers or anything like that, because what happens um, if bees, for example, lose their stinger when you squeeze it? You squeeze the remaining. Um, venom into the wound. So you scrape it off. Credit card, piece of paper, whatever, but you brush it off that way. They can still sting you, right? I've stepped on a bee after I squished it and, and yeah, ran to run after one of the kids, stepped on the bee and got stung in the big toe. Okay? It's a good thing I'm not allergic because I've had quite a few run-ins. Um, make sure uh, you manage their airway. Now that can mean a lot of different things, right? Do we need to suction? Do we need to bag them? Do we, you know? So what do we need to do here? Manage the airway. Um, maintain oxygen sats to 94 or better. Assist ventilations as needed. Remember, it's going to be difficult because of that laryngeal edema. It's essentially an obstructed airway. Would, uh, would nebulizer treatment be good to use? For no. Management? Mm -mm. Well. Yes, but it's not going to help them long term. And it only works if they can breathe deep enough to get it to the lower. Because remember, um, albuterol works on the lower airway. It doesn't work on, on the, bron the, so like the bronchus. The, uh, the only thing you can do is an EpiPen. Right, I mean, but even as a paramedic. No. Epi, Benadryl, we have a cocktail. And yeah, they, they do sometimes get... Um, um, yeah, an EB treatment. Why can't we get Benadryl? Because it dries you out. You give that to an asthmatic and they're really in trouble. Oh, okay. I was going to say, that just doesn't seem like that big of a deal. It is a big, yeah, it is a big deal. So if you don't know the difference, then you wouldn't be able to give epinephrine if it wasn't life-threatening or life, you know, endangerment. Right. Um, so assist ventilations, put them in the shock position. Again, you want to fill the container as much as possible that, so that they can perfuse at least the vital organs, okay, until, until such time that, you know, we can handle it in another way. Epinephrine auto-injector, okay, and then consider ALS backup. Okay, questions on this? Excellent. Um, epinephrine dilates the airways, constricts the vessels, and it, by doing, by constricting the vessels, it increases the vascular resistance, increasing my blood pressure. Okay, so it kind of shrinks back up what got open wide. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Cody, are you with me? Okay. So we already know that this is supplied as a solution in an auto-injector unit. What are the doses? 0.3 what? Okay, for who? What else is there? For children, yeah, for junior EpiPen, right? Um, so, indications, allergic reaction with the respiratory compromise, rapid labored breathing, chest, throat tightness, hoarseness, right? Uh, strider or wheezing. Remember the difference. What's the difference between strider and wheezing? Raise your hand, somebody. Yes, sir. One is on inhalation, the other is on exhalation. 
Which is which? Strider is ammulation. Okay. Weezing is in the Yep. Typically, you'll talk about expiratory wheezing. What's the other difference? Usually, it's the part of the airway that's affected, right? Strider tends to affect the upper airway and wheezing. Now, you can have bronchoconstriction that's going to cause wheezing even in the larger airways, but depending on the size, right, that's what makes the whistle. So think about it for a second. Open your mouth wide. Now try to whistle. Right? So you have to shrink the size to get the whistle. That's how it works, right? So if it, that's why it doesn't work well on the, on the big airways. Big airways, even when they shrink, may not shrink enough to go... Okay? That's kind of the, the thought process. All right? So hypoperfusion, rapid, weak pulses, or no radial pulses or no peripheral pulses. Okay? And that's going to indicate um, decreased blood pressure. Okay? Perfusion is what we're talking about or altered level of consciousness. Questions on any of that? I didn't get all that. Hmm? Well, I didn't put all that down. Contraindication. Hmm. Contraindications. There is none for a severe allergic reaction. None. So, again, in the, in the event that it's a life-saving, all bets are off, give the epinephrine if it belongs to them. Because then you have an order to do so, right? Why do I need to be careful in patients with cardiac history? Or of cardiac years, even? Because this is a medication that directly affects what's going on in your heart, too, right? So it increases workload, increases oxygen demand. What does it do to my coronary arteries? It constricts them. What happens if they're already narrowed? You can actually cause them to have a heart attack, right? So, we need to be assessing and be aware of that. doesn't mean we're going to withhold that treatment. It means we need to be prepared. Okay? Now, this might be just kind of like going off of the edge here, but say you do do this and then all of a sudden you start seeing the symptoms of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. um, and you give a nitro, is that, that really going to be no... Basically what I'm saying is... You're saying, am I going to cause them to go back down into a low blood exactly. pressure? Typically not. Nitro is a little bit shorter <laughs> acting. You may have to give them more than one dose of epi, though. So keep that in mind. And, and I want to make sure some other things don't relieve that pain before I start giving nitro. Because I know that by when you give that epi, their BP is going to go up, so therefore you're not going to really get an accurate uh, systolic on it you, you will. You will? Yeah. Even After it goes up and kind of settles down, which will happen before, right? If you assess it, you will find it before their chest pain starts, or at, at least at the same time that their chest pain starts. So start off with aspirin first, basically. Be the smart idea, and then go to Well, and, and that's kind of a, a well, no, and that's kind of a catch-22, because the problem isn't uh, necessarily occlusion due to a clog, it's occlusion due to spasm. And sometimes that causes people issues with no blockages. I thought aspirin didn't come to effect for like 30 minutes after taking No, aspirin it helps pretty quickly, actually. It's shown to be have a higher eff efficacy, so it's um, better to do it at the time of the event um, rather than that daily aspirin that people take. Right. Well, doesn't it help with the long-term effect of it better, it, aspirin? It helps to make you remember what is the what is the action of aspirin? Makes it makes it less 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 it's a platelet aggregate, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Sir. Mm -hmm. So here we go. Okay, go for it. Patient is having a heart attack and then gets stung by a bee. Goes into shock. What do you want to treat? The heart attack or the shock or the anaphylaxis? Anaphylaxis will kill him before the heart attack will. So you want to make the heart attack worse this game? Okay, you're, you're being far too, and technically what you need to do is probably call ALS because what they can do is they can give nitro by IV, so it's not as high of a dose, but we have a little bit more control. Okay. Ask a crazy question, you're going to get a crazy answer. I was just going to see what happened. Okay. Um, 
Again, remember your doses, okay? And there's two, and you need to make sure that you're giving the right one to the right patient, okay? That's part of our rights. So expose and clean the site if possible, remove the safety cap. We know this because we've done this on Saturday, right? Okay, 90 degrees to the skin, lateral thigh, midway between the knee and the waist, push against the thigh and hold for 10 seconds, okay? Um, and then apply pressure, dispose of your thing in a sharps container, monitor for effectiveness, right? We should probably, there's one thing we should probably do, and I know it's not on our checkoff list, there's one thing we probably need to do at least at the same time, if not before, we give an epinephrine. I'm not telling you to delay the epinephrine. Do not delay epinephrine in a case that needs it. No. 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 Give them oxygen. Give them oxygen. I mean, yes, all those are good thoughts if you, if you have the opportunity to do it, but they really do need oxygen when we go to give them an epinephrine. Okay? This? Yeah. Um, say for an, what's the pediatric? How old is that? Is it 55 pounds? Yeah, it's going to be like 35 to 55 pounds. Uh, I have another question. As far as the treatments go, or uh, interventions, what part of your patient assessment is that considered when you start using interventions? I mean, what? Interventions Wait, it, well, no, because it depends. If it's an airway, breathing, or circulation problem. Fix that first. Fix you, you fix it, find it. You fix it, find it. So if it's an ABC problem, you fix it, you find it. Is this an ABC problem? Yes. Absolutely, it's an ABC problem. Fix it, find it. Well, some. But, okay, so let's think a trauma patient with a, with a fractured arm. Those interventions don't happen until I've completed all my assessment. So I don't necessarily splint it, which would be an intervention in that case. Does that make sense? Well, medics were telling me that just taking vitals, manual vitals, that's an intervention. Any, any doing is Yes, and it depends on kind of their documentation because it falls under interventions for their documentation. Nobody ever told me that. I mean, it's all about documentation. It's all about what section it goes on your report, whether it's on the interventions or... That was another thing. When I talked to Rose, she was like, you could do this like this. And she was like, it sucks because Diane makes you put all this information in there that, like... They do in a computer system, and then they write their report, so it's separate. So like, mm -hmm. and they're not writing. She was like, "Cause this doesn't flow well." That's what I keep getting told by other people. Like my reports are thorough; they make sense, and I get all the information, but they don't flow well because of the way she has it to do them. Because don't let them fool you. I have seen most of them haven't even seen what their written reports look like as they print off. Those don't flow well either. Okay. The reason it flows well is because they know what tab to go to. Right? But when it prints out, it doesn't print out in tabs. It prints out in a flow sheet. Uh, okay. And, and then they go to the end and they write a narrative. Right. Okay. Uh-uh. Uh, I'm not buying that. And they, like, I had one person tell me, he was like, uh, he wasn't my person, but he told me, he said, um, he said, you have to make sure that they flow well because if they take you to court, then you're going to look stupid when they read it. No, flow only comes in your narrative. It does not include, if you have fill in the blank boxes, mm -hmm. that is not what they're talking about flow. They're talking about narrative flow. Okay. That would be like your chronological, your soap, right. those kind of things. Okay. That's what they're talking about. Okay. Where were we at? Mm -hmm. Side effects. Rapid heart rate, pale skin, headache, um, chest pain, nausea, vomiting, anxiety. Obviously, increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, right? Um, so, oxygen first, and then monitor your vital signs following use. Now, you don't need to get a blood pressure before you give epinephrine because, again, it's an ABC problem. We're going to find it and fix it. But we do need to get it pretty quickly thereafter. But we can do some sort of an assessment. How are we going to assess perfusion even before giving an epi EpiPen? Cap refill, what else? Peripheral pulses versus central pulses. Sean, is that what you were saying? Yeah, skin condition, absolutely. Okay, all very good, very good indicators of perfusion. So as long as you document that, that's your supporting evidence for following through with, right? Because you, it, it, depending on their skin conditions, their perfusion, their blood pressure, you might not be able to hear a blood pressure 
And you could dink around with that for four or five minutes, and by the time you're done with that, what, what happened to your patient? They have a they have potential. Yeah, absolutely. So now let's talk about spiders. There are 37,000 species. They are all venomous. Yes. They're all venomous. The difference is only 50 U.S. species can bite you. Granddaddy long legs? Yep. Very venomous. Okay? But their mouth is so small they can't bite humans. Okay? Um, 15 um, U.S. species basically produce symptoms. So even of the 50, only 15 of them produce symptoms that we, that we realize are symptoms. Okay? Um, so there are two that are considered potentially dangerous. The black widow and the brown recluse. Both of which we have in this area. No, they won't. Actually, it's not very common. We're going to talk about it. They can. They can. Okay? So they go as far north as Oregon and New York, pretty common in the south, southwest. Okay? Um, they have irregular webs, so that's kind of one of the indicators. It's irregular. Um, in wood piles, trash dumps, kind of dark places, okay? under rocks, this kind of stuff. Um, and they're occasionally in houses. There's a reason they call a woman who murders her husband a black widow. This is why. The females rarely leave the, neb, uh, the, the web, and they're the only ones that bite humans. Male black widows don't bite humans. They look different too, don't they? I believe so. And also, uh, don't baby ones, aren't they a different color? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I always thought that once they have sex, they choose. Yeah, she kills them. Um, all right. Um, so, black widows... They're a neurotoxic, okay? So this causes immediate, sharp pain, right? It's like a pinprick. You feel it, you know it, it, it hurts immediately, all right? You, start, you can start developing muscle cramps as early as 15 minutes to two hours. Um, upper extremity area, you're going to get pleuratic chest pain, all right? Lower extremity or genitals, you're going to have abdominal pain and even rigidity, okay? Muscle twitching, weakness, uh, paralysis, drooping of the face. This might look like a stroke, maybe. Yeah, neuro, okay. Um, sweating, tears, this is the difference. Salvation, uh, s salivation. Ah. Increased uh, bronchial secretion, so everything gets wet. All right, anxiety, headaches, restlessness, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, hypertension. Causes a lot of bad stuff, right? I see you making that face already. Sorry. Um, edema, skin rash, rash, conjunctivitis, itching, okay? Here is what gets people. Shock and really respiratory uh, depression, okay? Black widows usually peak within a few hours, can last as long as, you know, four days, all right? Um, they don't really know how many they kill. They don't really know. They don't really know how many people die. Um, most usually recover completely, and if they don't, oh, I think it's this one. I think it's this one. If they don't, um, they die. If they die, they're going to die within like 36 hours from respiratory. No, it's got to be a different one. Okay. Anyway, um, treatment: uh, apply a cold pack. Symptomatic care. Okay. Address their airway. Provide. You know, so it's going to be determined by what their symptoms are. Okay, because not everybody's going to have all the same symptoms. Okay, um, and then there's antivenom available. Okay, we're moving on. <laughs> the br <laughs> brown recluse is also known as the fiddleback, and can you see this right here? This is why they call it the fiddleback. See how it looks like kind of like that upside down fiddle here and here? Can you see it? No. You don't. You see how this looks like a, a violin at this end? Can you see these little line right here that goes down the midsection of the body? Yeah, kind of looks like the this part of the violin. To be honest, I'm petrified of spiders, so I truly hope that I'm around to do this. Well, don't we all? <laughs> so what do we need to know? They're in southeast um, and south-central U.S. 
Um, they do have some related species, like in the desert. Okay, um, these guys are really small. Brown recluse are, are small. Their body, they're very small bodied. But their legs are long. Mhm. Mm they look like that. Okay. Comparison to the size of the body, the legs look really long. Like an ant with legs. Yeah, but they're not big. Like like they're not like a banana spider big. Yeah, the big black and yellow. They're not like a wolf spider either. Wolf spiders we have here. Yeah, only they're small. I mean, with legs and all, probably that big around. Okay. Okay. That's <laughs> um, they're usually shy, nocturnal, so they're out at night. Okay. They like dark closets, basements, etc. Um, on floors, behind furniture, in your house. Okay. So what happens for a brown recluse? Initially nothing. It, you might have some mild stinging, but a lot of people who are bitten by a brown recluse initially don't even know they're bitten. Then they start to, within a couple hours, they start to get this kind of, just this pain, and they get this blue halo. Can you see the blue halo on the top picture? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not real prominent. Um, and then they start to form these blebs, right? Or like a, a blister kind of thing. It's a kind of a good way to describe it. Um, and then it just continues to grow, and that's ischemic. What does ischemic mean? It's killing your flesh. Well, it, <coughs> yes, that's what the necrosis is. Um, I thought ischemic meant like it was damaged. Okay. Never mind. I'm a little wrong. Tissue Lack of what causes ischemia? Um, so in five to seven days, they actually become, they start getting really necrotic. They develop these ulcers, severe lesions up to 30 centimeters in diameter. It essentially, it rots. I mean, it can leave like big craters. Yeah. Okay, rots soft tissue. So let's talk about some mild symptoms, which would be fever, chills, malaise. You guys remember what malaise is? Just, I just don't feel good, right? Um, nausea, vomiting, and joint pain. Now, more severe are bleeding disorders. Renal failure, what, what, what is that? When your kidneys kidney shut down. Yeah, kidney failure, okay? Convulsions, heart failure, and death. All right, pre-hospital management. What are we going to do for them? Uh, local cold application. Clean the wound. Uh, pad and splint using a bulky dressing. Mm. These are mine. I don't like these at all. Okay, um, 40 U.S. species. All right, only one of them is poisonous, which we don't typically have. Central Texas. Um, so the one that's poisonous is found in like Southeast California, New Mexico, I think Arizona, um, and then in far west Texas. Yes, you guys know which scorpions these are. Well, that's what we have here, the little brown looking. Yeah, the brown Do you know which ones are poisonous? Yeah. The black ones. Yeah, typically they're the black ones. Okay. Um, so local signs and symptoms, no local swelling or inflammation. Uh, they do just have pain and hypersensitivity. What is that? That's the name of the, that's the like um, bug name for the scorpion. Oh, okay. Yeah, the scientific bug name. Signs and symptoms, uh, extreme restlessness, agitation, roving eye movements, poor coordination or slurred speech, um, difficulty swallowing along with stride or wheezing, um, excessive um, salivation, tachycardia, tachypnea, hypertension, nausea, and vomiting. Yeah, wow. Has any of you guys ever been stung with it by a Texas one? I got stung when I was pregnant and I about... I thought I was going to fall out. It happens like when I got stung in the shower. They ganged up on me in the bed while I was asleep. That's what happened to my dad. It was underneath the covers at my Nana's house because she gets a bad. It is very common to, at night. Yeah, and it got him. He woke up in the middle of the night and was like cussing. And they they hurt. Like and usually the, they're, uh, they're fast moving, very fast, and they can pop you two or three times. 
you know, um, I, so I was laying there on the sofa, pregnant, sick, sick. I was sick the whole time. And I felt this sting, and I was like, what the heck is that? And I kind of looked at my leg, and what the world? Why is that still stinging? And I went to, you know, and right that second, it hit me. I had just gotten hit on the so I just got popped, and I was, I froze. I paralyzed. I swear to God, I thought, oh, my God, the world's coming to an end. And then I saw the nasty little creature running up the back of my sofa. I jumped up, screamed bloody murder. All the men in my house came running because they knew exactly what had happened to Mom. Like, it, my son don't even come running anymore. He gets the boot before he comes because Mom can't even step on him. Can't do it. And I... Mm -hmm. Well, and people may call, so you need to know this. People may call because they hurt, okay? Now, initially, when you get stung by the ones that we have around here locally, you won't see anything. If you haven't been stung, you look and you kind of go, what in the heck is going on? There's nothing there. And after a short bit of time, they kind of will swell up and they kind of turn white, and then you can see the red spot in the middle. And after about 10 minutes, it's done. Pain usually subsides, swelling is gone, the whole mess. So worse than a it just it stings continuously. I mean, like, so that whole five or ten minutes, it, it's like a sting the whole time, like a burn. I stepped on one and then took another step. I was like, what, what did I just step on? I looked down and he ran and I stepped on him again. He got me twice in the same foot. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And I think they freak me out so much because I'm from northern Missouri. We don't have scorpions there. And I think they look disgusting. They are kind of crazy. Are they like, is, are they like a seasonal thing? No. no. They're just year-round. I get them in the house. Year-round, all the time. And the thing is, depending on the color of carpet you have, if you don't know what you're looking for, you will not see them. Yeah. That's the problem. They like like these tight spaces. They'll get like at your baseboards, bathtubs and shower sinks are a big one because they kind of come up the drain, right? Yep. They come in, typically you'll see them come in if, if the rain is seen. I just felt something under uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they come in before big rains a lot of the times. And they can get in the small, they get into uh, the reason people have them in their beds. Do you guys know why that is? Yeah. That's exactly right. Really How many of you put your bed under your air vent? Why are you on the other side of the room? Mm -hmm. I may have to go home and rearrange my room. That kind of thought you might. <laughs> okay, but yeah. I like, I and, and, yeah. I am telling you, they are fast. If you haven't seen them, have you been stung, Cody? They will, I mean, like, like so fast you go, holy oh, my goodness, they, they are fast. The one that got me, I trapped him in a box and he died and saved him. Do they, are they just easily aggravated, or they just they don't stay pretty much? Can you just like get near just, it? Yeah, it, it's kind of like you're in their area. Yeah. You're in their, and so that one must have been in my sofa. You, you know how it took me to sit back down on the sofa? <laughs> I still don't much. I mean, I'm, I'm on a, you know, I couldn't sleep for like a week, and I had to check the bed all the time and stuff. They creep me out. You know how I put all my shoes in the closet? Tops of them, like where your foot goes, like facing down. They can climb right in. They like those dark spots. Yeah. Shake out your shoes. Oh, yeah. yeah, I don't put anything on. I watch a special about the like, scorpions and stuff in like, Africa. Some of it depends on where you live, though. Yeah. So, like, in Morgan's Point, I had them all over the place. When I lived out in Buckholt, out on these gravel roads, all over the place, like, all the time. Does bug spray kill these things? No. no. They have a hard coating. They have this coating, and you can't hardly spray for them either. There's a certain kind of thing... Yeah, they have like this armor. I used to, I didn't know that you could step on them and squish them because I thought they had this really hard shell. But yes, they have this coating that kind of protects them. So there is some powder or some spray that's kind of like um, little pieces of glass to them and they get into it and it sticks to them. That's the only thing you can do. So like normal spray and stuff doesn't work. <laughs> okay. So anyway, be aware because you may see them, you know, on a call, i.e. someone may call you and go, I got stung by a scorpion, and if it took you long enough to respond, there's not going to be any marks. I mean, you might kind of go, I don't understand. But they do. They do sting. Okay? And there's nothing you can do for it but kind of let the time go.
So what do we do? Um, symptomatic, non-specific. Uh, antivenom is available. So get this. So the ones that are poisonous, those black ones that are poisonous, the only place you can get the venom is right here at the Arizona State University. That's it. Well, yeah, the Southeast California, Far West Texas, Arizona, New Mexico Can area. Ship it or provide it anywhere else? Like, well, only big in that area. well, okay, so here's the thing that you have to know about antivenom. Well, it takes, it, it's very expensive. And so for like Crofab, for example, that's the antivenom for rattlesnakes and, and or for pit vipers. It takes like, it takes like two years to make one dose of Crofab. And they have to, and they milk the snakes, all kinds of snakes, we're going to talk about it in a second. And then they inject them into like clean medical sheep, and then they have to extract something. And then, yeah, I mean, it, there's a huge process, and it literally takes like two years in Sweden or Scotland or somewhere. So it's a, it's a big deal. That's why Crofab is so very expensive. Thousands, yeah. Yeah. Snakes. There's about. 45,000 bites a year when you talk about snakes. Only about 8,000 of them are from venomous snakes, and there's just about 10 deaths in the U.S. How many of you guys would have thought, wow, I would have thought it would be much higher? Especially in Texas. Well, they're big. People see them. Not necessarily. A lot of people who get bit by rattlesnakes, you know, the calls I have been on were I was over there and moving wood out of my wood pile or weeding around my bushes, and you kind of get into their area. They're camouflaged. I mean, that's, yeah, absolutely, naturally. So let's talk. So we have venomous snakes in the U.S., pit vipers, and that counts as your rattlesnakes, your copperheads, and your cottonmouths, or water moccasin. Okay? Water moccasin are aggressive snakes. Okay? And you're right. Rattlesnakes, typically, they don't chase you. They don't come after you. Usually, if you have an encounter with a rattlesnake, they've wandered into your camp or... You're in their environment. You've kind of stumbled onto them, like typically. Well, yeah. And so there's this.
They're going to get progressive edema.
tell you, and he didn't have any answer, and I don't know specific evidence either way. They also say the more they don't have the control. But he told me he couldn't, that he couldn't use any sign of And so there's all kinds of things that you can hear. Well, and it really does, I'm telling you, it really does have a stronger and now treatment profab now in the this is not does. It continues to move up. Yeah, it is. Well, we're going to talk about it.
me have a bear on your body. Oh. <laughs> Where did you go? Where were you at when you got Usually, uh, embedded to this embedded spot. 